from November 1973 till August 1974, the British progressive rock band Emerson, Lake and Palmer toured the Americas and Europe promoting their fourth studio album, Brain Salad Surgery. Keith Emerson, Greg Lake and Carl Palmer worked beyond their limits and assembled an astounding live experience like never seen before. Welcome back to Rocky State They Say, and today we'll continue the series with episode 4, Did Someone Get Me a Ladder Tour Stage Setup? But before we start, please click the subscribe button and ring the bell so you won't miss this channel's newest videos. And now let's start with the analysis. ELP always wanted to demonstrate that rock music could be also a cultural genre. They continued this path like they did on the Targus or the Trilogy tours. The technology used for this tour was improved in several ways, even to the point they had to innovate and commission the stage's crucial parts. And since the information available wasn't complete, I had to use the only info available and a bit of imagination. The stage experience for this tour has been taken as a game changer. And because of that, we'll see in detail what makes this stage experience so special. For this episode, I'll separate the analysis in two bigger parts, the story behind the album and the stage indeed. The stage part will be separated in six different sections. Top lighting rig, bottom lighting rig, screen projector, slides and curtains, PA system, instruments and effects used in the tour and additional equipment. After the release and the promotional tour for Trilogy, the band spent three months in a touring hiatus, and Keith took advantage of the situation, writing new music for the band. The earliest songs ever written or arranged were Carnival 9's first impression, at this time named Ganto 9, and the band adaptation of Argentinian composer Alberto Ginastera's first piano concerto, fourth movement, Toccata Concertata brought by Keith after Carl expressed his wishes of playing a drum solo. The band learned from their recording methods and how their new material worked on stage, and the approach chosen for this album was to write music intended for the live performance, instead of dozens and dozens of overdubs. But he wasn't the only one writing new material. Greg Lake was also writing new music, presenting Still You Turn Me On in early 1973. Tired of Island Records' lack of involvement, the band and their manager, Stuart Young, created their own label which allowed them to have more creative freedom. For this purpose, the band bought an abandoned cinema in Fulham, London, to work as rehearsal facilities and the brand new record label's headquarters. The brand new label was named Manticore, as a reference to the mythical creature which appears in Tarkus. But this new repurposed building wasn't occupied as you might have known it, with the band rehearsing the pieces in the main hall. Instead, the band had their own rehearsal room and office upstairs, a downstairs room which the band rented as a storage facility, and the main hall was used as a rehearsal stage before they went on tour, leaving the remaining space to accommodate the label's offices. As a side note, this hall wasn't only used by the band, it was rented to bands like Yes, Jethro Tull and Led Zeppelin. It was on this upstairs rehearsal facility where the band started drafting their new album, and it was clear from the beginning that it would be a challenging and a grueling assembly process, and it would need some improvements on the musicians' techniques. For example, Carl took timpani lessons to add even more sonic textures to the recording. Keith worked with R.A. Moog Incorporated and developed a new kind of synth, and Greg worked with Tony Simaitis to develop custom instruments. More on all that later. After extensive rehearsal sessions, the first songs were ready for the final test, the live performance. The band introduced their newest compositions on a warm-up European tour, which lasted from late March till early May. The audience response to the material was favorable, 
so the band continued rehearsing the pieces, adding more arrangements and changing some other parts. It was during this time the band wanted to make their own version of England's quasi-national anthem, Jerusalem, a poem by William Blake with music adapted from Hubert Perry's musical arrangement. It was chosen because it was a challenging unknown among the British people. This piece featured the Moog Constellation Ensemble for the first time. During the album rehearsals, Greg Lake contacted Pete Sinfield, who at the time wanted to release a solo album. Greg said to him that Manticore wanted to release it, but this came with a price, because Greg wanted Pete's help to write the album's lyrics. Pete agreed to do it, and soon he was at the Manticore headquarters to work with the band, who coincidentally was working on a new song. At this time, the band were composing what we know now as Benny the Bouncer, a comedic song with a strong Wild West vibe. What Pete saw the first time was Kid playing a western tune on the piano, and Greg singing with a Cockney accent, things that took him by surprise. He and Greg wrote the lyrics based on Greg's early shows with the Gods, played at Salisbury City Hall. But this wasn't the only piece of lyrics the duo would compose together. The band showed to Pete another new song called Ganton 9, and his reaction was that the music sounded like a carnival. The piece was renamed Carnival 9 soon after, and it transformed into the darkest and longest song of the lot. When Pete started the co-writing lyric process, the words for the first impression part 1 were practically ready. With the ideas about a carnival-like freak show taking shape, Pete wrote about the sordid exhibitions, including a real blade of grass, supersonic fighting c**ts, seven virgins and a mule, among others. Many of the lyrics were created to achieve the dystopian future the band wanted to show, further explored on the song's third impression. While impressions 1 and 2 dealt with inhumanities and exploitation, Impression 3 explored the concept of humankind being overthrown from the dominant species lot by computers, their own creation. This idea was further enriched by Sinfield's experience working in a computer company. Pete used his experience on how the electronics work to imagine computers becoming sentient beings, surpassing humanity and turning them into slaves. When the band felt comfortable with the new compositions and the material rehearsed, they entered at Olympic Studios in June 1973 to work solely on Carnival 9's first impression. But this wouldn't be a quiet recording session period. Greg and Keith argued many times about the key the song would be performed, and finally an agreement was reached. The album version would stay in the original key, while on the late renditions the music would be tuned down to accommodate Greg's vocal range. Following a period of further writing, the band reconvened at Advision Studios in August to record the remaining songs. The first songs it recorded at those sessions were Carnival 9's remaining impressions, which took the first half of the month. The next song to be recorded was Toccata, which received an additional instrumentation before its final version was recorded. Carl had written a percussion movement, as it was convened by him and Keith, and after extensive rehearsal, the track was recorded around September, only to realize they hadn't the publishing rights to release it. Keith contacted Hinastera's publishing agency, Busy and Hawks, who responded that the composer wouldn't allow any adaptation of his works, but they advised him to talk to him personally. And so Keith did. He got the composer's phone number and contacted him to explain the issue, to which Emerson was invited to Hinastera's home in Switzerland and played the recording for him. After the dinner, the composer was excited about playing the tape, and so it was done. It turned out that he didn't speak too much English, so his wife, cellist Aurora Natala Hinastera had to be the translator. After listening to the piece all the way through, Hinastera exclaimed, Diabolic. Keith was utterly terrified, because he thought the composer hated it, and in a fraction of a second he was thinking in how he would tell the news to the band, and especially which song could replace it. But then everything changed. Hinastera started smiling, and talked to his wife, to which she responded, and I quote, Alberto says, you have a very talented band, and he very much likes your version. He says, 
that is the way his music should be sound and will be contacting his publisher tomorrow, giving his permission for you to release it. No one has been able to capture his music like that before. Keith returned to England with Hinastera's blessing, so the song was finished and included in the album. The next song recorded was Still You Turn Me On and Jerusalem, without any issue in the studio. As a side note, lots of people say that Jerusalem was the first song to feature the Mook Constellation synth ensemble. And while this might be true, if we take into account the album's final running order, if we consider the album session's chronological order, the first song ever to feature the ensemble would be Carnival 9's third impression. The last song included on the album that was recorded is Penny the Bouncer, and to achieve that hunky-tonk piano effect, Keith had to detune one of the strings in each piano key. It worked marvelously well, and suited perfectly that Wild West vibe mentioned earlier. The sessions included three tracks which weren't included on the album, and those tracks are When the Apple Blossoms Bloom in the Windmills of Your Mind I'll Be Your Valentine, Tiger in a Spotlight, and Brain Salad Surgery, tracks the band worked once all the other songs were ready, making the most of their time left in the studio. When the Apple Blossoms was an outtake developed from a jam session on which the band didn't really treat it like the seriousness they treated the main songs from the album. Tiger in a Spotlight is a track which originated from another jam session, and it was finished on the spot a couple of hours later. As a side note, this song might have appeared on the album if Hinastera had denied the permission to release Toccata. Brain Salad Surgery was a composite track merged from four different ideas, and it never was meant for release, it was just a throwaway track. The results from the recording sessions were mixed during October at Air Studios, but the band completely rejected the first mixes, and as a result, a new mix had to be made to fulfill the band's ambitious musical vision. Once the material was approved by ELP, it was sent out for vinyl pressing. The album's artwork story goes like this. As a suitable cover for the album was needed, Manticore manager Peter Samste suggested a painter who was a friend of him, Hans Rudy Geiger. After the band played a gig in Zurich, Samstag and Emerson went to the artist's home, who himself was a fan of the band. At the time of the meeting, Geiger has just finished his latest work, Work 216, Landscape 19. Emerson felt immediately that the painting suited perfectly what the band was making in the studio, so he asked Geiger to paint something similar for the album cover. After explaining the album's working title at the time, Whip Some Skull On Ya, which meant fellation. Geiger's work is widely known for its wide usage of obscure themes, biomechanics, eroticism, and a strong industrial aura, something that ELP was making as well. A few months later, the band, accompanied by Pete Sinfield, Peter Samstek, and Stuart Young, visited Geiger's home once more, this time informing the artist that the album's name had changed to Brain Salad Surgery which retained the original meaning. Geiger then showed them two new paintings with the approximate size of a vinyl record, and those paintings were Work 217 ELP and Work 218 ELP2, both inspired by Geiger's partner at the time, Lee Tobler. The guests approved the artwork right away, and when art director Fabio Nicoli was working on the album's vinyl sleeve, he insisted that the sleeve had to be a non-conventional construction, with the front cover splitting in half to show the complete woman portrait once the sleeves were opened. This approach was finally approved, and ELP's newest album wouldn't be remembered by the music, but for its unique artwork as well. Bain Salad Surgery was released on November 19, 1973, and the setlist was this. After the writing and recording of the album was complete, ELP focused on the live experience, and following their innovative line, they completely changed their stage set for wood. For this tour, the band contacted Judy Rasmussen to design their massive lighting rig, and included partnerships with IES sound systems, metalwork companies, various engineering firms, 
among others. The band started their tour in Miami, USA on November 14, 1973, and soon proved that their massive equipment attracted the music press, often praising the band for their astounding stage set as well as their stellar live performances, which proved the band right about their composition approach. The new material worked extremely well on their live performances. The tour consisted of 105 concerts in the USA, Canada, the UK, Spain, Switzerland, Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium and France between November of 1973 and August of 1974. The top lighting rig for this tour consisted of five massive structures, from which approximately 108 lights were hung. The way I'll approach this section will vary from the previous analysis, as I consider the supporting structures are worth mentioning. The system was designed by Judy Rasmussen and included four huge ladders and a custom-made proscenium arch above the band. The ladders measured approximately 8.5 meters in height were secured by three triangular struts each and were connected to a lighting ladder with a space for 14 lighting fixtures. The proscenium arch measured approximately 14 meters wide, 1.6 meters height and 6 meter depth, and it was suspended about 6 meters over the stage. In large auditoriums, this arch was hanging from a catwalk, which was located far above the actual lighting rig. From this catwalk, a series of chain motors and hoists held the proscenium arch in place. In smaller auditoriums, the arch was attached to the hall ceiling via a series of chains. All the lights in this section are part 64 lights with color gels beside them. So, based on all the footage available, the top lighting ring should be placed in this order. We can divide this section in two, the lights on the arch and the lights at the ladders. In the first section we have 52 lights pointing to the band, separated in the front row and the rear row. In the rear row we have 28 lights, the first 20 divided into 5 white lights, 4 blue lights, 3 purple lights, 3 green lights, 3 yellow lights, 1 red light and 1 magenta light. Besides, there were 4 red lights and 4 blue lights to illuminate the backdrops. In the front row we have 6 red lights, 6 blue lights, 6 green lights, 3 yellow lights, and 3 white lights. In the second section we have 56 lights pointing to the band, separated evenly in 14 lights per ladder. Each group contained 2 white lights, 2 red lights, 2 magenta lights, 2 yellow lights, 2 green lights, 2 blue lights, and 2 purple lights. The bottom lighting rig for this tour was consisted of approximately 68 lights in total and further developed the atmospheric ambiences the band wanted to show. We can divide this section in four. The first section is located right in front of the curtains, where we have 12 lights divided into four red lights, four blue lights and four yellow lights. The second section is located on Greg's spot it contains 12 lights divided into 2 white lights, 2 yellow lights, 2 green lights, 2 blue lights, 2 magenta lights, and 2 red lights. The third section is located in Carl's drum kit riser, consisting in 44 lights in total, divided into 7 white lights, 7 yellow lights, 7 green lights, 7 blue lights, 7 magenta lights, and 7 red lights. Besides, there were two strobe lights used only during Toccata's drum solo. Now that the basics are explained, let's talk about the elements for which this tour is known for, elements that are crucial in the visual aspect of the show. Let's start with the screen. The circular screen the band used was 4.75 meters or 15.6 feet in diameter and was composed by a steel hoop and a projection cloth. 
it was attached to the Lightning Rigs catwalk via two chain motors and could be moved independently from the curtains. The projector the band used wasn't a projector per se. Based on photos from the era, it might be assumed that the band used a follow spotlight as its projector. This assumption is further fed by the fact that the circular screen was at different heights during the performance and a normal projection system could meet the band's needs, as for example, a system involving a carousel projector would be too hard to execute. Furthermore, the screen never stopped showing slides, independently from the screen's position. The slides that were used replaced the gels that a common follow spotlight would have. These lights can be divided in two groups. The first one is based on the album's artwork and the tour program, which you're seeing on screen now. And the second one is a series of assorted images with the sole purpose of adding a visual accompaniment to the music. The assorted images aren't defined or follow a determinate order. Instead, they're just a group of random images which were rotating across the tour. And last but not least, let's talk about the curtains. The enormous curtains that were at each side of the screen were attached to a truss box, which at the same time was attached to the catwalk structure via several motor chains. Those curtains measured approximately 6 meters in the widest part, 60 centimeters in the thinnest part, and 12 meters in height. The material used was a thin fabric. This avoided overweight in the overall structure, but still allowing the visual aspect to shine with its own light. The band's PA system wasn't as complicated as some would think, allowing a compromise between a powerful sound system and a relative lightweight overall structure. For this occasion, the band contacted Integrated Entertainment Solutions or IES, a renowned sound company in the British business, and soon the sound system was complete. The final assemble was presented to the band, and they used it for their rehearsals and the tour dates. This new PA included 32 cabinets which included a system of folded horns, speakers and Twitter horns, 5 monitoring stacks comprised by a speaker and a Twitter horn, 12 Crown DC 308 amps. To capture the band's sound and derive it to the PA system, the band hired a Mavis test. The Mavis Acronym for Musical Augmentation Voicing Instrumentation System, the band used included 30 channel inputs, which allowed to pick up every sound the band made individually, mix it, and send it to the PA system. This equipment was set up to achieve a quadraphonic sound into the auditorium, with Greg and Carl often using the front row of speakers and Keith using the rear row of speakers to play the synth parts. The only problem with this approach is that many times the system was kind of impractical, due to the fact that it blocked the emergency exits. Besides, the band used two multi-track tape machines to record the band's performances. This tour featured new instruments and new amp stacks, which transformed the already powerful sound the band made. To make a complete analysis of the band's live sound, I've separated this section in three, one subsection for each band member. Kid's keyboards were augmented for this tour in a substantial way which allowed him to add even more textures to the band's complicated sound. This tour was the first and only to feature a Lawrence upright piano and the Moog constellation, comprised by a Moog Apollo, a polyphonic synthesizer, and a Moog Lyra, a mini Moog on steroids in Keith's words, both prototypes being fruit of Emerson's work together with Array Moog Incorporated. The instruments he used in the stage were a Steinway Model D274 Grand Piano, two Moog Mini Moog Sims, a Lores Upright Piano, a Honor Clavinet Model D6, 
el refurbished Hammond Organ L100, a Hammond Organ C3, a Moog Constellation Prototype Synth Ensemble, an Advanced Moog Modular System 3C, comprised by one 901 module, three 901A modules, nine 901B modules, three 902 modules, one 903A module, one 904A module, one 904B module, one 904C module, one 905 module, three 911 modules, one 950 keyboard unit, one 956 river controller unit, one 960 module, one 961 module, one 962 module, one 984 module, one 992 module, one 993 module, four CP3A modules, a 14 preset box selector, a spring reverb cabinet, a sequencer unit, and a monitor unit. To power up his Moog modular, Keith used a phase linear PL700 series 1, which fed the synth with 350 watts. Besides, he used four Leslie speakers model 122 and two Leslie speakers model 760, fed by four high watts CP103 amp heads and two preamps. And last but not least, Keith used a Steinway Baby Grand Piano as a stage prop. How? Well, it was attached to a complicated system that allowed it to spin and rise from the stage level. Not that how it worked is pure speculation, because the staff who designed it kept its functionality a secret. It is probable that behind the curtains that hit the mechanism was a system comprised by various hydraulic pistons with bearings on its tip, allowing the metal shaft which was connected to the piano to have freedom of movement. To allow the structure to spin, it's probable that the shaft was attached to a couple of motors which allowed the whole structure to spin. This prop only worked in larger auditoriums, outdoor concert venues or venues where it was a very low floor because of the height needed to allow such a piece of engineering to work properly. Greg's gear was further expanded for this tour, which meant changing his main instrument and changing his amps and cabinets. Following the last tour, Greg contacted British luthier Tony Semedis to work on a few instruments, including his now famous double neck bass and guitar. Besides his now classical Fender jazz bass, Blake also acquired some Gibson Reaper bass guitars. The instruments he used were a Fender jazz bass, Two Gibson Reaper bass guitars, one in black and other in natural finishes, a Gibson J200 acoustic guitar, a Semaitis 12 string acoustic guitar, a Gibson Les Paul Black Beauty, a Semaitis custom metal front electric guitar. His amps suffered a complete replacement for this tour, which included two custom cabinets, which included a folded horn a 2 per 18 inch custom made cabinet and three tweeters on each of them, a custom made rack which included two crown DC300 amps, an industrial socket and three preamps, and four concert reverb amps. Carl's drum kit was completely replaced but keeping the same configuration as the previous tour. For this occasion, he contacted a metal factory and several engineering companies to achieve his desired vision. Not only that, as soon as the tour finished, he took a course in timpani at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama 
and then expanded his kit to include timpanis, gongs and one of the earliest examples of a percussion synthesizer. The drum shells were commissioned to the British Steel Corporation, were 6.35 mm or a quarter of an inch thick and were crowned with wretched steel tom hoops, giving a total weight of over 2 tons needing to reinforce the stage, and presented engravings designed and made by Paul Robin using a dentist drill as a tool. He did a common ball on one top, on other a hedgehog, a turkey, a man on a horse and a fox each engraving made on the smaller toms. All the concert toms were mounted into two supporting structures made out of steel tubes and included all the mics for toms and cymbals embedded into the drum set. This was one of the first drum kits featuring an electronic drum set, but how it worked, Bob Moog gave a Synthbox prototype to Carl, and with a little help from various engineering companies, he was able to reverse engineer and find out how it worked. After the actual drums were manufactured, a pickup microphone was put inside the four smaller and the biggest tom he had in the kit, allowing the signal to be derived into the synth box and trigger five different and independent signals. All his cymbals were pasty 2002, and the final kit was like this, which included a 28 per 20 inch bass drum, 6 per 6 inch, 8 per 8 inch, 10 per 10 inch, 12 per 12 inch, and 15 per 15 inch concert toms, 16 per 16 inch, and 18 per 18 inch floor toms, a 5.5 per 14 inch Ludwig Super Sensitive Concert Snare Drum, 2 Ludwig 26 and 29 inches Timpanis, 24 inch China Cymbal, 22 inch Crush Cymbal, 24 inch Right Cymbal, 17-inch 7 sounds set number 3 Formula 602 Crush Cymbal, 7-inch Splash Cymbal, 5-inch and 3-inch Children's Cymbals, 8-inch Bell Cymbal, an 18-inch Crush Cymbal, 13-inch Hi-Hat Cymbals, 24-inch Crush Cymbal, 2 Pasty 38 and 15-inch Symphonic Gongs, 1 kit of tubular rails, one old gate bell foundry rejected charge bell, a custom synth fox, four temple blocks, a flexa toe, a row of ten camel bells, a vibra slap, a ratchet, a pair of maracas, a violin bow, drumsticks and brushes, a tambourine, a cymbal and a chain in a pocket, an extra large triangle and a custom-made PA system, made from a mixer and two of the aforementioned monitors. Carl's drum kit was resting over a rotating platform activated by manual power. This had a regular tridecagon shape, with a diameter of 3.5 meters, 40 centimeters in height, and had a canal to accommodate the 42 par lights used to illuminate the drum kit, and had only its sides covered in mirrors. Over the platform was a pagoda-like wooden frame, which worked mainly to hold Carl's gongs and the bikes picking the cymbals, triangle, camel bells, and the church bell. This wooden frame was made from 4x4 4 4 inch wood strip and measured 2.6 meters in height, 3 meters wide, and 1.4 meters in depth. A distinctive part of Greg's spot was his rug, but apart from the aesthetic side of the show, it had a fundamental role. It turns out it wasn't just the Persian rug we all know and love, it included also a rubber mat, which prevented Blake from getting electric shocks when he was singing. The Persian rug was used to cover that rubber mat, 
giving the stage a unique aesthetic. Kids Moog Modular had a prop which was used at the end of Carnival 9. Everything was mounted in a metal frame which had the same dimensions as the enormous synth, and it was placed about 3 meters behind it. This metal frame had two part lights with yellow and blue gels, respectively, and two strobe lights, to give the theatrical effects Keith wanted to deliver. Besides, it included several smoke machines and a flashbox to represent the computers overrolling humans, but its most distinctive feature was a pair of silver wings, which were manually risen at the same time the Moog Modular was turned over to the audience. Those wings measured approximately 3.5 meters in height when fully deployed. When the album went gold, Norman St. John Stevas, British Minister for the Arts at the time, gave the band the golden records. Although the band rehearsed extensively for this tour, there were several incidents that put the band in danger, especially to Key. Among these incidents are one occasion when the pyrotechnics embedded to the MOOC's ribbon controller blew one of Emerson's fingernails. The piano lead on Keith's spinning piano slamming his hands due to a sudden spinning stoppage. One light falling from the proscenium arch almost hitting Carl on the head. And a piece of stage floor collapsing due to the massive drum set's weight in West Virginia before a show. When the tour finished in the USA, the band arrived with its equipment in the UK, taking them several days to pass the 40 ton equipment through customs at a cost of £3,000, being charged for every piece of equipment. After the exhibition Geiger in Prague was closed on August 31, 2005, the two original artwork paintings were lost or stolen, and haven't been found yet. Apart from Emerson Lake and Palmer, uh, other artists we signed with Manticore Records were Italian bands, Banco del Mutuo Scorso and Premiata Forneria Marconi, Little Richard, Pete Sinfield, British rock band Hanson and American rock band Stray Dog. The band's tour name was most likely inspired by Still You Turn Me On's lyrics. Shortly after the release of the album, Manticore Records sent out a mail shot to schools asking pupils to design a picture to illustrate their interpretation of the album, a contest called Sound Into Visions. Winners in each group should accompany ELP on a future concert tour. The band's catering requests for every hotel they stayed on included things like three bottles of red wine, two bottles of white wine, a bottle of cognac, 24 bottles of beer, 24 bottles of coke, 4 liters of milk, 4 liters of orange juice, 3 liters of tomato juice, tea and coffee. The catering requests for the crew were, before the concert, all stage workers and engineers must get a warm meal, and during the show a cold buffet has to be available. On February 2020, Radar Pictures, the company behind the Jumanji franchise, managed to secure the rights to transform Carnival 9 into a feature film, based around the title and the lyrics. At the time of release of this video, no further updates has been given. Although this tour featured a tape machine to record the shows, the amount of live material is scarce. Live releases include the live album, Welcome Back My Friends, to the show that never ends, Ladies and Gentlemen, Emerson Lake and Palmer, released on August 19, 1974. It's an album recorded at Anaheim Convention Center, Anaheim, USA, on February 2, 1974, and was originally mixed in quadraphonic sound, and the resulting vinyl was a stereo mix down from that master mix. The sound quality suffered from this treatment, but that wasn't the only mix the band made. Manticore sent a true stereo mix with an abbreviated set list to the King Biscuit Flower Hour for its broadcast in late 1974, being heavily bootlegged since then. Another important official release is from the performance given by the band at the California Jam Festival on April 6, 1974 at the Ontario Motor Speedway, Ontario, USA. It appears in diverse bootlegs and official releases, 
including Then and Now, Beyond the Beginning, and Leaving California 74. The most unreliable pieces of equipment were the Moog Modular and the Moog Constellation, this last one being so sensitive to humidity and temperature changes that it had to be covered with aluminum foil when not used. On October 2, 1973, Carl was invited to show his drum set and play a drum solo for the British TV show Aquarius, which footage was broadcasted in 1974. The new Musical Express issue from November 10, 1973 came with a free 7-inch flexi-disc presenting excerpts of songs from the album and the song Brain Salad Surgery in its full length. Jerusalem was the chosen single to be released, but the BBC banned the song from airplay, making it fail to chart. During the tour, Greg Lake and Carl Palmer expressed their disapproval about the transportation costs that the Moog Modular produced for the band. But what did we learn on this occasion? That this tour succeeded when we talk about the band pushing the boundaries of what a stage show could offer. But however, this same feature was its Achilles heel, because the band had to reach collaborators outside the music business to acquire their unique pieces of equipment. Sadly, many considered this tour to be the band's absolute peak, and after a two years hiatus from recording and touring, the band reconvened in 1976 to work on their next album and tour, Works, on which the band would tour with a 70-piece orchestra. So, thanks a lot for watching this video, and while I make the other stage videos, just keep watching the rest of the series and the content in my channel. If you have a suggestion for a stage tour analysis, just let me know. I'll make it for you and I'll put you in the credits. Please join to my Facebook, Twitter and Instagram accounts and follow all these projects while they're in the creation phase. See you next time and have a great day!